In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we look back on many of the events of our lives, maybe last week, last year, or even as far back as when we were youngsters, we always seemed to be able to conclude that hindsight is always 2020. If I only had known then what I know now, it would have been so different. Hindsight is always 2020. So when we look back on certain difficult times and events in our lives, we see with the utmost clarity how God used all those circumstances to create something that we could never have imagined. As much as we try to solve all our problems or to try to be in control or on top of things, somehow we couldn't, but somehow God did. No matter what the event was, good or bad, God used and continues to use all the experiences of our lives. And that's because God uses everything, not only for our own good, but for his greater glory. And the bottom line is that we need to trust him. And that is the theme of my homily this morning. God uses everything. Trust him. Now, looking at this morning's Holy Gospel, we see a time of crisis for a New Testament family. And then we see how each person in that family responded to the Lord's apparently imperfect timing. What we do see in the passage is this, that God uses everything, no matter how dire our circumstances might appear. And this morning's gospel proclaims to us once again that we need to trust God. Now, the story about Lazarus tells of three things, sickness, death, and resurrection. Everybody involved in this story knew and understood the power of sickness and death because it was all around them in their simple agrarian culture. But Jesus was the only person who knew where all the true power resided when it came to resurrection. So only he knew how the story was going to end. He wrote the last chapter. He knew the ending. Now one of the first things that this family did when confronted with a difficult circumstance, and that is the serious illness of their brother Lazarus, the first thing they did was to tell the Lord what was going on. Lord, the one you love is sick. And since God uses everything, then the gospel tells us to turn to God at the very beginning of a problem or a situation and ask God to tell us what to do. And then we go to those we love, our family, our friends, and share with them because we trust them. You know, in many of today's churches, there's a lot of competition. Our parish is the best. Our musical program is the best. Our clergy are the best. Our staff, our congregation is the best. And so there's a lot of pressure put on all of us to use a mask of saying to the general population to preserve our image that everything's fine where we worship, no problems here, despite the problems of other churches and other clergy and other staff in the world. And so we tend not to talk about all those discomforting things that are happening to us behind the scenes. But it's in revealing these hard issues, it's in sharing these hard issues that we really discover who really loves us, that we really discover that God does love us as well as those we trust. 
Now we are continuing to engage ourselves in the search process. The next phase of that development, of that maturational journey, is to meet in small groups where you will tell one another how you feel about this parish, about the clergy, about the staff, about the universal church, the body of Christ, and how our tradition meets today. Holy Scripture tells us maybe we need to pray and ask God first and say, God, what are the words I need to use to share with my brothers and sisters in this process that you are calling me to be engaged in? If you really care about me, Lord, let me tell you and ask you first. So if God really cares about us and people really care about us, then they are going to want to hear about what's going on in our lives. God cares about what happens to you. God cares about what happens to this parish or the church universal or the nations and the peace around the world. And so if God cares about them and the people you love care about you, then share that with God first and then with those you love. And then return the grace and the favor by helping those who are in hard times that you love deal with their crisis and their hard times. Show how God's grace can be a vehicle for them. It is a covenant. If those who love you will help you, then those whom you love must need the same grace of God in their lives, coming through you as God's vehicle. Now, when Jesus heard about Lazarus' sickness, he made two enigmatic statements. One, that Lazarus was going to be okay. And two, that Lazarus, that God was going to glorify himself by glorifying his son in the events that were about to happen. And then Jesus does a very unexpected and unusual thing. He waits another two days before going to Bethany. Now think about that. How many times have you been frustrated with God's timing in your life? You probably run out of fingers and toes to count the number of times that you have asked God to intervene in your life and God has waited. Like, where are you, God? I need you now in my life, in this parish, in the world, to find the missing plane, to have peace in the Middle East, to help our brothers and sisters who are so poor they cannot feed themselves. Why are you delaying that age-old question? How frustrated we are because we can't be in control and we can't know right now. Well, the response of Lazarus' sisters was no different. They were very confused. They were very anxious. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus and that he loved them. But still the Lord delayed his arrival. And when he finally does arrive, both Martha and Mary, sisters who were very close to Jesus, talked to him separately because they wanted to find out why. Why have you frustrated us with a person you loved so dearly? Let's look at Martha first. Martha was known for her, for her busyness and impetuousness. Typical of Martha, as soon as she hears that Jesus has at last come, she immediately runs out to him and she just lets him know that you have failed our family. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. What's happening here? Why were you delayed? I thought you loved us. Typical of our questions. God, if you love me, come and redeem me. But do it now because I don't have a lot of time. Note that Jesus neither rebukes Martha for complaining nor defends himself for his tardiness. He simply remains close to her and soaks up all her frustration. And in doing so, he is like his heavenly father. 
You know why? Because God knows the big picture. Let's face it, he not only wrote the last chapter, but he read the last chapter before he read the rest of the book. He knows the whole picture, but we don't because we can't be in control. We have finite minds. We can only deal with one thing at a time. Sometimes we can't multitask. He knows how frustrated we are. He knows how out of control we are. But what does he do? He does not slap us around. He stands and hugs us and embraces us, and he soaks up our frustration. That's okay. I can live with your impatience. I can live with your impertinence. I can live with your impulsiveness. That is okay. I will soak that up into my love. Next, Jesus engages Martha in an unexpected theological conversation about the resurrection. Martha then expresses her belief in new life for the dead on the last day, but not necessarily her belief in Jesus as the power behind the resurrection of the dead. So Jesus calls her on it. He says to her, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will live forever. Do you believe that? And to Martha's credit, she doesn't hesitate to express her unwavering belief, not only in Jesus' power, but in everything he claimed to be, in everything he claimed to be. And that is the simple nature of of belief. It isn't complicated at all. It's only complicated because we make our faith and belief complicated. To believe in Jesus is simply to accept that what he says is true. Now Jesus' reaction to Mary on the other hand, was significantly different from his reaction to Martha. Mary was known for choosing the better thing, the better portion, as Scripture says, and that was to focus on Jesus before anything or anyone else. He had engaged Martha in a theological discussion, but his reaction to Mary was different. He reacted to Mary's grief, and he was deeply moved and deeply troubled. Why would Jesus be upset if he knew what he was about to do? He knew the end of the chapter. He knew what was happening. Why would he be so visibly upset? You'd think he'd be trying to hold back a smile or a smirk knowing that he was about to do an incredible thing in raising Lazarus. But instead, what happened? Jesus wept. He cries. Jesus has never been a mere passive observer of those who are suffering, especially of those who belong to him. He knows your pain. He cries when you cry. He knows your frustration. He hugs you and absorbs your frustration and your tears and your uncertainties and your anxieties. He does because he is in you and you in him by that image that he created. When he rebuked Saul on the road to Damascus, he asked the religious antagonist, why are you persecuting me? What did I do to you? You will hear those words on Good Friday. Oh, my people, what have I done to you that you have prepared a cross for your Savior? What's going on? What did I do wrong? Same thing he asked Saul. Yet, despite what he was about to do for Lazarus, Jesus felt Mary's grief. He felt his own grief, even though he was, it was going to be dispelled with unspeakable joy within minutes. You see, it doesn't matter to Jesus if our grief lasts an hour, a lifetime, or we milk it forever. He feels it as deeply as we do. And you know, sometimes he feels it even more than we do. 
And so after his encounter with Mary, Jesus turns to Lazarus' tomb and asks for the stone to be removed. And after praying out loud to his heavenly Father, Jesus calls Lazarus out. And the once dead man walks out of the tomb, still in his grave clothes. And as a result, many believe. So, what does this story about Lazarus cause you to believe? If God can raise the dead, is there anything less impactful that he cannot do? Is there any problem, situation, or circumstance that God cannot redeem? That God cannot, in a sense, resurrect from a seemingly hopeless situation? The answer to that question is no. When you bring your complaints to God, he may engage your head as he did with Martha, or he may engage your heart as he did with Mary, or he might engage both. However he does it, God has something gracious to show you and me in every life circumstance while we are here on earth. Whether joyful or difficult, God uses everything, sickness, financial hardship, perhaps a wayward child, perhaps the loss of a job, perhaps an addiction. All our anxieties and uncertainties, even our Lenten journey, which is about to come to its glorious end. And yes, he uses even death. God uses everything. Trust him.